A few things that you need to know about Whitman and the Civil War. Most people know Whitman as the author of Leaves of Grass, of course, and maybe one or two other pieces that are you know, outside of uh, that collection of, of poetry that he put out much earlier, uh, and also maybe a couple of uh, his essays if you're a real Whitman enthusiast. But a lot of people don't know an awful lot about his war experiences. Whitman was um, really too old uh, to serve uh, and really didn't have the temperament to pick up a rifle and serve in the Civil War anyway. Um, but when his brother was wounded uh, in combat, he decided to dedicate himself to uh, assisting the wounded because he was so appalled at the state of medical care for wounded uh, soldiers. Uh, when the war started, there was no ambulance corps on either side, honestly. There was no, I mean, nobody nobody even thought of this, that people would get shot and need to be attended to. So Whitman moves from New York down to Washington, D.C. and spends quite a bit of the war down there. Uh, sadly, he probably died many years later of an illness that he contracted while he was in the hospitals. It could have been tuberculosis, probably was, but it might have been something else as well. But uh, Whitman, uh, like many people, died from something that happened to them during the Civil War only many years later. Louisa May Alcott did. She, uh, she uh, took mercury to deal with uh, an illness that she contracted while working in the Civil War, and the mercury eventually killed her many years later. Uh, so the war just continued to ripple and reverberate for years after the war was over. His poetry really was fundamentally changed by the war. Yes, he came out with later editions of Leaves of Grass, but he really didn't produce as much poetry after the Civil War as he did before. His years of being very prolific as a poet and as an experimenter in the area of poetry largely were behind him once the war was over, and he dedicated himself more towards prose and sort of rewriting the material that he wrote before. It's kind of hard pre to, to read his pre-Civil War material, his Leaves of Grass, his Song of Myself, and so on, which are all about optimism, all about brotherhood, about um, the oneness of the human race, about holding hands with one another, the optimism, the, the idealism. Uh, it's easy to see how after the Civil War and its devastation, he would find that whole effort, that whole chapter or episode, earlier part of his life, something that he kind of had to rethink and had less enthusiasm for that sort of material. But let's take a close look at The Wound Dresser, especially its most important passages. And I want, while we go through it, I want you to note the tone of resignation, uh, which I think really captures the essential feelings of those who witnessed the war. It's a really great um, exemplum of, of, of what the war did to people psychologically, and Whitman was in a great position to see that. He's describing in the poem an experience after the war of having been asked by younger people, uh, he of the old man, gray hair and whiskers, um, you can imagine children sitting around him saying, what did you do in the war, uh, old man? Uh, not grandpa, he didn't have children that we know of, um, although he said he, he may have fathered some. Um, but, uh, you know, they're sitting around uh, the fireplace and saying, tell us about the war, uh, Grandpa or old man. Uh, what do you remember from it? And so he's having to go back, back, back into the recesses of his memory to, uh, to bring all this up, stuff that he'd kind of wanted to forget, stuff that he kind of, you know, hasn't fully dealt with. So in that sense, it's a very sophisticated poem. It's really interesting. It's about how we as human beings process traumatic experiences. And that's really a neat thing about the poem. He, he does some, some interesting stuff with that. But let's take a look at how it opens and read some, some key passages. There are five basic sections to the poem. Uh, and the first one starts out, An old man bending I come among new faces, years looking backward, resuming in answer to children. Come, tell us, old man, as from young men and maidens that love me, aroused and angry I thought to beat the alarm and urge relentless war, but soon my fingers failed me. My face droop and I resigned myself to sit by the wounded and soothe them or silently watch the dead. And this is actually very true because early on in the war, the first few months of the war, Whitman was the one who was saying, uh, beat drums beat, as one of his poems went. Um, it's, we need to go off to war and win this war. And he was very enthusiastic supporter of the Union cause. But within a few months... Uh, as the poem here says, I resign myself to not yelling so loudly, but just quietly, silently soothing the suffering of others. 
to sit by the wounded and soothe them, he says. Years hence of these scenes, of these furious passions, these chances of unsurpassed heroes. Was one side so brave, the other was equally brave. You hear that? This after the war, of course. Now be witness again, paint the mightiest armies of the earth, of those armies so rapid, so wondrous. What saw you to tell us? So there's the setup, there's the scene. In stanza two, he goes on to say, O maidens and young uh, men I love and that love me, what you ask of my days, those the strangest and sudden your talking recalls. Soldier alert, I arrive, a long march covered with sweat and dust. In the nick of time, I come. So he's going to tell you, he says, I, like a soldier, I'm going to charge back into those memories. Uh, but in silence, in dreams, projections, while the world of gain and appearance and mirth goes on, so soon what is over forgotten, and waves wash the imprints off the sand, with hinged knees returning, I enter the doors, while for you up there, and he means the soldiers who have died, whoever you are, follow without noise and be of strong heart, he says, as he's about to begin his backward look into his past memories. Bearing the bandages, the water, the sp and sponge, straight and swift to my wounded I go, where they lie on the ground after the battle brought in, or to the rows of the hospital tent, or under the roofed hospital to the long rows of cots, and down each side I return. To each and all, one after another, I draw near. Not one do I miss. An attendant follows, holding a tray. He, refu he carries a refuse pail, soon to be filled with clotted rags and blood, emptied and filled again. I onward go, I stop, with hinged knee and steady hand, to dress wounds. I am firm with each. The pangs are sharp, yet unavoidable. One turns to me his appealing eyes. Poor boy, I never knew you. Yet I think I could not refuse this moment to die for you, if that would save you. On, on I go. Open doors of time, open hospital doors. The crushed head I dress. Poor crazed hand, tear not the bandage away. The neck of the cavalryman, with the bullet through and through, I examine. Hard the breathing rattles. Quite glazed already the eye, yet life struggles hard. Come, sweet death. Be persuaded, O beautiful death, in mercy, come quickly. From the stump of the arm, the amputated hand, I undo the clotted lint, remove the slough, wash off the matter and blood. Back on his pillow, the soldier bends with curved neck and side-falling head. His eyes are closed, his face is pale. He dares not look on the bloody stump and has not looked on it yet. I dress a wound in the side, deep, deep, but a day or two more, for see the frame all wasted and sinking, and the yellow-blue countenance see. I dress the perforated shoulder, the foot with the bl bullet wound, cleanse the one with a gnawing and putrid, putrid gangrene, so sickening, so offensive. I am faithful, I do not give out. Notice how graphic this is. Notice how very gritty and realistic and harsh this is. This is not a poetry the average middle class 19th century Victorian American reader would have been used to. Things that are clotted, putrid, gangrene, the death, the rotting, the, 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 the wasting away. This is not soldiery from a romantic perspective charge of the light brigade it is not it is death it is suffering and it is quiet it is inevitable it is almost bordering on a sort of hoped for euthanasia at times this is not the sort of brave dashing napoleonic i will go into battle and no one will hurt me kind of this is not that at all it's really different folks it's very different. And in fact, he's got a kind of a variation on the childhood nostalgia poetry that was so popular in the era. Um, a lot of 
pre-Civil War and some post-Civil War poetry written by popular poets like James Russell Lowell and John Greenleaf Whittier and uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and all these guys. They loved writing nostalgia childhood poetry, poetry about, oh, when I was a child and I was a little boy living back in the woods and such, and life was so good and our values were so pure and family was excellent and all this kind of stuff. And this made you feel kind of warm and fuzzy inside about your childhood. This is different. This is, hey, years ago, when I think back on my memories, especially of the war, and I was younger, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. It was really ugly, and it was sad, deeply, deeply sad. There's no, there's no wailing. There's no crying. There's no pulling hair. Uh, there's a, it, the point of, of sadness is so deep, so profound, that none of those gesticulations of emotion actually do any good. I mean, there's nothing sadder than a fellow who can't cry anymore, and that's what you get from the poem, it seems. The nation, however, was ready for a more realistic portrayal of life's harsher events. It had seen the pictures of the dead. It had seen the dead. It had experienced all of this. In the last stanza, he tries to make sense even of the memory. He's an old man, he's lived a long time, and he's reliving it through his memory, and still he struggles to make sense of why did this happen and what did it all mean. Thus in silence, in dreams projections, returning, resuming, I thread my way through the hospitals, the hurt and wounded I pacify with soothing hand. I sit by the restless all the dark night. Some are so young, some suffer so much. I recall the experience, sweet and sad. Many a soldier's loving arms about this neck have crossed and rested. Many a soldier's kiss dwells on these bearded lips. He spoke a lot and wrote a lot of letters about his experience with the soldiers and how sad it was and how many of them um, he got to know as individuals. Um, and, you know, small things like writing letters for them home to their moms and dads. Um, he said it was funny because he said very rarely did they did they cry about dying uh, or show fear of dying. They usually showed resignation, acceptance of their situation. There was no sense of panic in most of the people that he saw that died. There was more of a sense of I'm sad that I won't get to see home again, or the, the ones that had been amputees. Of course, they used a, a type of ammunition at the time that when it hit uh, a soldier, um, it would shatter and crush the bone, and there really was nothing to do except to amputate the limb. There was no healing it once it had been crushed. It wasn't a break. It was an absolute disintegration of the bone, and so amputations were very, very common during the war. In fact, believe it or not, this is an interesting statistic. The state of Mississippi in 1868, I believe, the number one budget item in the state government's budget for that year was artificial limbs. They spent more on artificial limbs than they spent on education, roads, prisons, anything. I mean, that is a huge statistic there in terms of what it means. And so the number of people who had suffered lost limbs was tremendous. There was no sanitation, no, no um, sense of you know sterilizing anything. And, and uh, even if they had time, they wouldn't have known to do it. Uh, I mean, they used dirty instruments. People died of infection, disease all the time. And so Whitman is on the front lines of this, seeing it day to day, getting to know these individuals one by one. And it's not a heroism of charging into battle that he is eulogizing here. It's a heroism of acceptance of our mortality, acceptance of the fact that, sad as it may be, Many of these young men died, but they died not as raving heroes charging into the, to the battle lines, but there was a bravery in their acceptance of their position in having to accept their own mortality. This is really different. It's not a, like I said, a, a crying and wailing and gnashing of teeth kind of sadness, but it's also not an absolutely bleak kind of sadness, like life sucks and that's it. Um, there's something noble he thinks in the experience. The poem is about trying to find out what that noble thing is. What is it? And he spends a lifetime trying to find out. I know there's something noble in this sacrifice, but I've yet, as an old man even, every time I rethink about this situation, 
to, to exactly put my arms around what it is other than the basic humanity of each individual soldier and each one's compassion for other people.